Hey everybody, we're going to pick up where we left off with taking a pulse. So let's get started. I'm going to roll back through to where we were. Don't forget to be studying for your um, vital signs portion of the test. You'll be having a quiz soon, so just be sure that you're ready. Okay, so what we're doing when we take a pulse is we're actually testing or we're checking to see how many beats a minute the heart, how frequently the heart is beating every minute. Um, it's felt through an artery um, as the blood pumps. It puts uh, a, a, and blood passes through. It's kind of like a wave through the artery, and so that you can you can actually feel it beating. Um, it can be felt more easily when arteries are close to the skin, um, so we don't have to push very hard. If we push down very hard with the pulse, then we'll actually occlude it, and we can't feel it at all. Um, there are several places in the body we're going to talk about that you can check a pulse. Um, and it's an indicator of a lot of things, um, cardiovascular wise, um, whether or not maybe there's an occlusion or there's a lower or weaker pulse on an arm or a leg or um, it up to the brain, we can tell by feeling the pulses um, how the cardiovascular system is doing. There are a lot of things that affect the way your pulse rate uh, is maintained. One of them is the brain stem. So the brain stem, um, it controls all of our vital signs and so sometimes if we have something going on that's affecting the, the, ner uh, the nervous system it will also affect our pulse. Age affects our, affects our pulse just like we talked about with temperature. Um, with pulse it also does affect it because as we age our body starts to wear out so the heart has to work harder. That means that the um, sometimes pulse gets stronger or weaker depending on how our, our, um, our cardiovascular system in our heart is. Fever, exercise, fear, anger, and anxiety, um, excitement, heat, those all can raise our, uh, initially raise our pulse rate. So it can make it quicker. Um, a normal resting pulse rate should be between 50 and a little less than 100, less than 100, or even 50, less than 100. Um, so initially, any of those emotions or any of those changes or physical exertion will raise the pulse. Same thing when we get too hot. Sometimes when we have position change, our pulse will go up and then it will drop significantly and pain will also make our pulse um, increase. Medications can be taken to either increase or decrease our pulse based on what's going on with us cardiovascularly. So sometimes our, um, our pulse may be really rapid, so they'll give us a beta blocker and a beta blocker will help slow that heart rate down but may also make the cardiovascular system um, work more effectively. If someone has a low heart rate or they have atrial fibrillation or some other cardiac arrhythmias, they may give them a medication like lenoxin or digoxin that will actually make the heart beat a little stronger um, and make it be a little bit different, change the rhythm. Um, and then we have to monitor that pulse when we're taking those medications to make sure the pulse doesn't get too low or too high. So pulse sites, and you will need to know these pulse sites. So you have a temporal pulse, one that runs up near the head. Most of you can feel that fairly often, especially when you exercise. You have a femoral pulse, which is in the, uh, in the groin area. You have a popliteal pulse, which is behind the knee. A posterior tibial pulse, which is behind the ankle bone. A dorsal pedial pulse, which is on the top of the foot. Most of you are most, most familiar with the radial pulse on the thumb side of the um, of the hand, and then you have a brachial pulse, which is in the bend of the arm, and the carotid pulse on each side of the neck. You want to be sure that you only check one pulse at a time. You don't want to check the pulse on both sides at the same time because it can occlude blood flow to both locations. So just be sure that when you're checking a pulse, you can check each side, and it's important to check each side, but you don't want to check them at the same time. You want to check one, see how that feels, see if it's bounding, see if it's um, sluggish, just kind of see how that feels, and then if it's regular or irregular. And we need to, um, if we're going to check a pulse for 15 seconds, we have to multiply that times four. Um, 30 seconds, we multiply it times five. But when we're initially learning to check a pulse, we always want to check it for a whole minute. We want to count each beat for a whole minute. Um, so, you know, as time goes by and you get really f comfortable and, and familiar with checking a pulse, you can do it for 15 or 30 seconds. But 
Initially, I want you guys to be sure that you count the pulse for a whole minute. Okay, so counting a pulse. Um, when, we, when we count a pulse, it's usually for 30 seconds, but like I said, multiply it times two so we can get our pulse per minute. Um, we have to note that. We note the rhythm. We note the pattern when we document it. We, uh, if the beat is irregular, we count the pulse for a full minute. So if you're feeling someone's pulse for 30 seconds and it's beating along really good and you're having one beat about every, um, anywhere from a half second to a second, and then, oh, excuse me, then all of a sudden it stops and then kind of feels like it skips a beat, you want to go ahead and count that for a whole minute. Or if it's beating really, really fast, you want to count it for a whole minute. Things we also want to, to determine is the, um, is the strength of that, of the pulse. So when we feel a pulse, is it strong? Does it feel like a regular, normal heartbeat? Is it bounding, which means it's very strong? Um, that would be what it would feel like once you work out. A thready or a feeble pulse would be one that's very difficult to feel. A thready pulse is when it's skipping beats. A weak pulse is hard to find. So that's when we document those, we have to document it strong. Um, full, bounding, weak, or thready, we, um, or a feeble pulse. We document them that way so that when the doctor comes in behind us or as the physician, when we, that patient comes back in, maybe they've had a procedure. An example is sometimes you will check a carotid pulse on each side. And the left side may be normal, but the right side may be a little bit thready or it may be weak. Um, and sometimes that means there's occlusion. So there's blockage in that, um, in that carotid artery. So they do a procedure called an endarterectomy where they actually um, clamp off the artery. They open, make an incision in the neck. They clamp off the artery. Then they go in and they clean out the blockage. Um, there's a high risk of stroke with that, but we still have to do it sometimes because of how much occlusion there is in there. So when they do that, it's important to know what the pulse felt like before. So once it's all cleaned out, you can tell if those pulses are equal um, or if it's still weak or thready, maybe the graft and maybe the sutures haven't healed well. Um, there could be several reasons. Maybe there's still some inflammation in there. So we want to make sure we understand um, and we can tell the difference in the right and left side of the pulse. So a radial pulse, this is the most common way that we will check a pulse. Um, you're going to feel on right inside the bone, on the inside, um, of the, on the thumb side of the hand. You're going to go, uh, you'll be able to feel a, a, a ligament that's really kind of hard right there about where the, um, the thumb pad curves. If you go over just to the thumb side a little bit, you should be able to feel your pulse. And you're going to, you're going to bear, you're going to touch it to where you can feel it, but not push any further. You want to use two or three fingers over that side of the hand to hold, to feel the pulse. Um, that's your radial artery. You're going to feel that for at least 30 seconds, multiply it times two. Now you'll notice if you try it and you push down hard on it, you're going to not be able to feel it. So you don't want to push real hard. You want to just be able to feel it. And as soon as you can feel it, stop applying additional pressure. And then, like I said, um, 30 seconds, multiply it times two. But if it feels like it skips a beat or it's beating too fast, you count it for a whole minute. Okay, so there, um, we're going to talk about using a stethoscope because we have to use a stethoscope to check um, an apical pulse sometimes, and we'll talk about apical pulse just in a little bit. We also have to use that for um, checking a blood pressure. So things that we always do first when we use a stethoscope, whether it's our stethoscope or someone else's, we are going to, and you can use this to test a, um, a pulse anywhere, but definitely we need to check an, an apical pulse. And an apical pulse, if you think back, when we talked about the heart, the apex of the heart is, you know, it sit, the heart sits in the middle of the chest and the base is at the top. And the apex is the point that kind of is more on the left side of the heart. I mean, the left side of the chest, and it's going to be down closer to the rib cage on the left side. The, the between the, um, you can, you'll be able to hear it good between the third and fifth vertebrae. There. I mean, not sorry, vertebrae, the third and fifth rib there. So, Let's talk a little bit about the first thing that we do when we are going to use our stethoscope. First thing we're going to do is we're going to clean it before and after we use it. Because remember, we might not use it every time we go into a patient room or we come in contact with a patient. 
but that it may have accidentally touched a patient and we don't want to carry microorganisms from one patient to another. So we have to be sure that we, just like our hands, that we clean every time we walk in and out of a room, we do the same with our stethoscope. Um, we want to know, know that the larger side, so the, um, you have a diaphragm and a bell. The flat side or the, round, the larger round flat side is called the diaphragm. And the bell is on the other side. It generally doesn't have that flat uh, cover over it. It'll be open, not always, but sometimes it'll be open. But the bell will be the smaller circular um, side of the stethoscope. Most stethoscopes will turn in one direction so that you can hear one side or the other. Um, from a lot of experience, if you're going to have to listen to someone's chest, their heart, um, take an apical pulse, you may have to put the stethoscope against their skin to check their blood. When we check their blood pressure, you're going to put it against their skin. So you want to be sure that you warm that up a little bit because alcohol is really cold once you clean it. Um, if you're going to listen to a apical pulse, which is over there between the third and fourth rib, you are going to be sure that you um, have that patient um, kind of roll over, lay them flat, roll them over on the left side, and have them um, hold that stethoscope, the diaphragm portion of, for the bell side, and you're going to listen to that apical pulse. We're going to use the flat diaphragm side for pretty much anything else, to listen to the heart, to listen to the lungs, um, to listen to um, the brachial pulse when we take a blood pressure. We're going to do that. Um, we don't want, to, we want to be careful about the tubing. The tubing is what goes between the earpieces and the diaphragm. We want to be careful not to have that banging around. We want to make sure that it's straight and smooth when we're using the stethoscope because if it's bent, you won't be able to hear quite as well. Now I'm going to show you guys an example real quick of taking an apical pulse. Let me find that video again real quick. Okay, so we're going to watch this one real quick because it's a short video. I'll let you guys watch what an apical pulse looks like. Always explain to the patient what you're going to do. I'm going to go ahead and take your apical pulse, okay? Bring the head of the bed up, and I'm also going to bring the bed up. To assess a person's apical pulse, listen with a stethoscope to measure the client's heart rate and rhythm. Although the clients can be lying down when you do this, a sitting position is best. Okay. I have to expose you for this. So like I said, they're going to be laying down. Because to hear the high-pitched heart sounds, place the diaphragm of the stethoscope over the point of maximal impulse, which is approximately at the fifth intercostal space at the midclavicular line. Count the number of heartbeats by starting with the number zero when the second hand hits any number on your watch or clock. The count of one is the first heartbeat after timing begins. The lub-dub sound is considered one beat. The apical rate and rhythm is normally assessed for 60 seconds. Note the rhythm of the heartbeat by assessing the pattern of intervals between the beats. A regular rhythm has equal spacing between beats. back up. Go ahead and lower your head back down here. Record the client's rate and rhythm. A normal adult heart rate is between 60 and 100 beats and the rhythm should be regular. Report your assessment as necessary. Okay, that's it for an apical pulse. Sometimes we have patients, like I said, that are unable to um, sit up for that. So if they're going to lay down, we're going to listen between the fourth and fifth intercostal space or between the fourth and fifth rib. We're going to have them roll over a little bit to the left side just so that we can hear better. All right, let me, sorry, let me get back to my, to where we were.
So we've already talked about the apical pulse. Um, you're, it's going to be taken with a stethoscope. You're going to listen to the heart. You're going to count for a full minute. A really important time to take an apical pulse is if someone has had a recent procedure, cardiovascular procedure of any kind, but also if someone has taken lenoxin or digoxin because they have atrial fibrillation. It's really important to do an apical pulse for a whole minute and document that because when someone's taking digoxin, lenoxin, lenoxin is the name brand, digoxin is the generic name. If someone's taking that, their, whole, their pulse must be greater than 60 for you to administer that, um, or it will make their heart rate slow down too much and they'll have adverse effects from that. So you want to be sure that um, you want that you have you've checked an apical pulse at any time that it's necessary. If you have an irregular pulse rate, you want to be sure that um, you report that to the doctor, especially if they're on a medication that's supposed to regulate it and the previous shift or the previous person that listened to them said it was a regular heart rate and you find it irregular. Um, and so you just wanna be sure that you document that clearly. Um, apical and radial pulse. So an apical and the radial pulse rates, they should be equal. So if you take a, a if you listen to the heart and you listen and you take an apical pulse as well, they should be the same. There are times that it's not. Um, and that can be due to occlusions. It could be due to different, multiple um, different cardiovascular rates. But if they are different and there's not a documented reason in the physician's notes, you want to be sure that you go back and that you notify the physician that there is a difference. Um, you can also ask another person to come in and check as well. It's never a bad idea to have someone, a second person checking. Um, so, and, and you don't check them at the same time. So you're going to be listening to the heart rate and timing, and then you're going to take a radial pulse and you're going to time it, but you definitely don't want to do them at the same time. And it's okay to check both pulses, both arms. You may check the left arm and the right arm. Um, after you take an, have taken an apical pulse, if they're different, um, it's really important that you do that as well to, so that you can document to the doctor that the apical pulse was 75 but on the right wrist, it was 80, and on the left wrist, it was 75. So you wanna be sure that um, you, you document all of those kind of things. So normal adult pulse rate is, if it's greater than 50, we have to, if it's less than 50, we have to notify the physician immediately. When the pulse rate gets below 50, we start to have um, a change in circulation to the brain. For um, a normal adult pulse, it should be at least 60, but greater than, but no, not greater than 100. Anything over 100 is considered tachycardia, which is a, low, a word we learned earlier in the year. Bradycardia is below 60. Also, another word we learned this year means slow heart rate. Um, I do want you to be sure that you know this diagram at the bottom. The pulse ranges for different ages, birth to four weeks. That pulse can be 60. I'm sorry, 80 to 180. That's big, that's a big, big difference. Four weeks to a year, 80 to 160. Um, one to two years, 80 to 130. Two to six years, 80 to 120. Six to 12, so as you can see, it starts to regulate. But once someone gets to be 12, they, that they're considered, and as far as pulse rate, they should have a normal adult pulse rate once they get to 12. Be sure you take a minute, write those numbers down because you will see them again, okay? Make sure that you make yourself familiar. Once again, you're going to have a quiz over temp and pulse um, this week, and so you want to be sure you know those. Uh, counting respirations. Now, this is one of the sometimes easy, but sometimes not so easy, um, depending on how someone's breathing or what they're wearing or um, their size. Sometimes it's difficult to check uh, a respiration by just watching. Sometimes we have to lay our hand on the upper part of their chest just to feel their chest rise and fall. One respiration consists of inspiration and expiration, so I would know that. One, one respiration consists of breathing in and breathing out. Um, chest, chest rise, once again, breathing in and breathing out. You guys know what that is. You count each time the chest rises and falls for 30 seconds, and you multiply it times two. Now, if, someone, if you're having trouble seeing how someone's breathing or they're not breathing in a regular rhythm, we might want to listen to it. We might want to check it for a whole minute. Um, if you know, so it says don't let the person know you're counting their respir respiratory rate because sometimes they'll breathe um, faster or slower because it'll make them a little anxious. I'm not really ever worried about that too much. I mean, they pretty much knew I was counting their respirations. 
Um, but count it after you take the pulse. Keep your fingers on the pulse side. You can, you know, you can continue to, uh, once you've checked the pulse, you can continue making it look like you checked the pulse and watch the respirations. You guys will get to a point over your career as a healthcare professional that you'll watch respirations while checking a pulse. So that's a, that's a definite possibility. Um, know that the normal adult uh, respiration rate should be at least 12 to 20. Um, once we get above 20, we start to kind of get to concerned about what's going on with them. Are they having respiratory issues if they're below 12 or are they having um, issues related to their pH level? So abnormal respirations, anything over, and these are vocabulary words that you definitely want to know. Abnormal respiration rates, tachypnea means an, an, um, a rapid respiratory rate over 20. Bradypnea, penia means related to breathing, um, it will be a respiratory rate below 12. Dyspnea is shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. Apnea means without, without, uh, without breaths or no breathing. Hyperventilation is very fast and deep respirations where they are, where they're excessively um, breathing, basically they're breathing too much carbon dioxide out and they're not getting quite enough oxygen in. People tend to pass, pass out from hyp hyperventilation. Hypoventilation is very slow and very shallow respirations. Generally, there's a serious um, health-related issue if someone has hypoventilation. Okay, we are going to stop there today because blood pressure is basically its own lecture because it'll take us just a little bit. Um, be sure that you have gone over your notes. You have a good set of notes for pulse, um, respiration, and temperature because you're going to have a quiz over that tomorrow, okay? All right, everybody have a good day, and I'll be back with you later. Thank you.